It's an official event of Climate Week New York City. Um, we're very pleased to be part of it, and they also have been very helpful in helping promote the event. Um, now, if you go to other Climate Week events, you're going to hear a lot of presentations about how much trouble we're all in collectively around the world. And tonight, we're focusing really on solutions. So this is the uplifting side. Um, now, to set the stage for the solutions, uh, it's, not, it's not gloom and doom out there, but it's kind of gray and cloudy, and there might be thunderheads in the distance. Emissions are continuing to grow worldwide. They're going down in many industrialized nations, including the United States, which is great. But if we're keep going to keep dangerous climate change at bay, we need them to go down much faster than they already are. Now, there's a challenge with that. Modern society, which I personally enjoy a great deal, uh, requires a lot of long-lived infrastructure, you know, things like railroads, like I rode on this morning, and cement factories, and power plants to make sure that all of our, uh, all of our little devices can continue to work tomorrow, and all of that sort of thing. And many of those pieces of long-lived infrastructure, for example, power plants, have a design lifetime that is probably longer than we can afford to allow them to emit if we are going to achieve that avoiding of dangerous climate change. So climate policy has recognized this challenge for a while, and the standard solution to this has been offsets. We're going to, for those industries, those sectors of the economy that have a long transition to a low carbon or a zero carbon future, we're going to allow them to pay for another sector of the economy to remove carbon more quickly. And that way, we collectively as a society will not lose uh, the benefits of capital investments that have already been made. And a key type of offsets, a key component of offsets are uh, carbon sequestration, actively removing carbon from the atmosphere and putting it somewhere else. Well, where are you going to put it? The typical answer has been we're going to put it in forests. Um, because, of course, trees, as they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the course of photosynthesis, they store it in wood. The carbon stays in the wood as long as the wood hasn't decayed. Now, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, forests play a very critical role in climate dynamics overall, and there's a lot of them. We found out just in the last couple of weeks that there are three trillion trees worldwide. Three trillion is a very large number. Put another way, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that there are 638 billion tons of carbon in the world's forests. That's enough to build about 18 uh, US-style single-family homes for every family of four on the planet. So instead of going to your second home in the Poconos or the Berkshires or Southampton, you could instead go to your 17th home, which I don't know where that would be, Detroit maybe. Um, so, and forests also have big effects on climate beyond carbon. And we're just beginning to understand these. And this is a really important point that I'll come back to at the end. But we, uh, the way we manage forests affects how much uh, they reflect, uh, how much incoming solar radiation they reflect out to space. It affects the amount of water vapor they emit. It affects the amount of cloud formation that occurs. They have wide effects on climate beyond simply their storage of carbon. Now, with respect to the offsets piece, the sequestration piece, the usual approach with forests is we're going to make as much carbon as possible stay in the forest. Uh, for example, the Red Plus approach is focused on reducing uh, tropical deforestation, making sure as much carbon as possible stays in the forest. The EU's very ambitious proposal that they have just submitted to the uh, climate talks in Paris that are coming up in December calls for a 40 percent reduction in their emissions. They achieve 5 percent of that 40 through storing more carbon in the forests of Europe. Um, and uh, the California Air Resources Board's exceptionally pioneering work uh, to reduce uh, reduce climate change and uh, to sequester carbon, again, focuses on payments to encourage people to leave carbon in the forest. Well, that only makes a difference. More carbon in the forest only makes a, in one place, only makes a difference if it's additional. If, you know, we aren't just driving the harvesting to somewhere else where someone is not being paid 
to keep the carbon in the forest. So for these kind of sequestration schemes to have the kind of imp impact on climate change that they are expected to have, n the net effect has to be to reduce the amount of forest harvesting, to reduce the amount of wood that comes out of the far forest. And that actually creates a bit of a problem. And we actually, the way climate policy is headed right now, I think we actually have the potential for a perverse and unintentional increase of emissions. Um, and the reason for this is if less wood is harvested and the price of wood therefore goes up in comparison to other goods, more of other building materials will be used in place of wood, particularly concrete and steel. And of course, concrete and steel dominate in everything except single family residential construction today. So, you know, that's a bit of a problem. And concrete and steel have a much higher carbon footprint than does wood. And in addition, uh, carbon is stored in the wood, as I mentioned. So you can actually sequester the carbon in the forest or you could sequester the carbon in long-lived buildings. On average, taking a ton of wood and using it to build a building displaces a ton of car if you're displaced, if you're replacing steel or concrete with that wood. A ton of wood used to build a building displaces a ton of emissions out of the atmosphere. It's a ton less that we have to cut from somewhere else. And in addition, a half ton more is sequestered in the wood itself. So instead of focusing only on how to increase that 638 gigaton of storage uh, idea, um, we think it's important to think about how can we use our forests to maximum advantage considering all aspects of their use and of the alternatives to their use. Uh, this is a fairly radical idea with respect to global climate change policy. And the way we articulate it within New England Forestry Foundation is that at least with respect to boreal and temperate forests, and this doesn't really necessarily apply to tropical forests, which we can talk about in the discussion section, um, a better approach to maximizing the carbon benefit of our forests than simply trying to reduce harvest would be to use our forests as a green carbon pump to keep them forests, to harvest them sustainably, to improve their health as we do it, and to store that as much as possible of that removed carbon in buildings. Research by the New England Forestry Foundation shows that in New England, we could use 400 million more board feet per year just in traditional construction without even getting into the fancy stuff that Michael was talking about. 400 million board feet more per year, which would keep 3.5 million metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere each year. That would be about a 3% reduction in the emissions of New England, just by building more with wood. Call it nature-based geoengineering. Um, so what are the factors that determine if uh, the climate success of this? First, we need to increase building lifespans. We need to come up with plans for reusing and recycling the wood at the end of those extended lifespans. We need to minimize waste in logging and processing. We need to reduce deforestation so that this isn't just an excuse to clear the forest and never grow it back. And we need to manage the forest for the right species mix and age structure to maximize both carbon storage and those other climate effects that I spoke about. And that, what that right species mix and age structure is will change through time as climate itself changes. And so this does require active management of the forest through time. There's also a range of policy changes and incentives that could help us move toward this vision. And these come out of, um, largely out of a series of interviews that Emily Kingston did this past spring and summer, uh, talking to stakeholders from the architectural sector, engineering companies, forest products companies, uh, government uh, developers. So some examples of the types of policies that could make a difference. We could have a no net loss of forest policy to keep land forested and yet at the same time allow continued harvesting of that forest. We could have a fossil carbon tax as opposed to simply a straight carbon tax. We could develop a communications campaign that highlights the sustainability benefits of wood buildings by the category of building, low rise, mid rise, high rise, commercial, residential, et cetera. 
we could create purchasing preferences for wood construction, particularly in those audiences that are most interested in those sustainability benefits. We could provide low interest rate financing for wood construction or tax incentives, including perhaps property tax abatements. And finally, we could provide, we could enhance existing policies for encouraging sustainable forestry and avoiding forest conversion, things like current use taxation that allows landowners who are committing to conserving their forest for a certain period of time to receive reduced uh, property tax rates. So there's a lot we could do going forward. There's a lot of changes that are needed to maximize the benefits, but overall, using our forests to build long-lived wood buildings while keeping them forests is probably our, one of our best win-win climate strategies. Thank you.